Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the three-part educational program series on artificial intelligence and elections. I'm Frances Zahn with League of Women Voters, Southwest Santa Clara Valley. We're one of the five leagues in the Bay Area. Today's session will be recorded and the video will be posted on our league website and YouTube channel for those who cannot join us. Before we uh, begin, just a quick background on the League of Women Voters. The League has been empowering voters and defending democracy for over 100 years. The League is a nonpartisan political organization for women and men, encouraging informed and active participation in government. We have two distinct roles. One is voter service and public education, and the other is action and advocacy. So today, on to our main topic. Um, in this three-part series, in our first session, we learned about some basics about AI and algorithms and how they can be used in elections to spread misinformation. So today, we'll take a deeper look at what we can do as individuals to fight misinformation and disinformation. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please type it into the, uh, sorry, if you have any questions, please type it into the Q&A box. We'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, but if you have some comments, um, please use the chat box for that so that everyone can see your comments. And during our presentation, we will have some interactive portions. Um, we would encourage you to participate with the uh, chat box there. So now I would like to introduce our featured speaker today, Ms. Kathleen Tobin from MediaWise. Um, Kathleen teaches digital media literacy and fact-checking skills, and she also works with teens and college students across the U.S. to teach their peers about media literacy. And previously, she has spent many years as a reporter and taught high school journalism. Um, so now uh, I'd like to turn it over to Kathleen. Okay, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you all um, inviting me to this webinar. Um, it's always great to, to speak with people and try to share our information and get out our resources for you. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, let's see, here it is. All right, and everyone is able to see that. Yes, looks great. And hear me well. Okay. So yeah, today I want to talk to you all um, a little bit about telling fact from fiction online. And I'm going to concentrate a bit on, ask me to, AI elections and how you can fact check things that you see. Um, a little bit about me first. I know I know Francis told you a little bit. I'm, I am based in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, which is on the Gulf Coast near Tampa and Clearwater. Um, I've been here probably 35 years or so, um, but I grew up, I was born in Ohio, grew up in Maryland, grew up in New Jersey, went to a tiny little college in Maryland called Mount St. Mary's, uh, where I thought I wanted to be a teacher. I got an education degree, but then I changed my mind. I went to University of Florida and became a journalist. I got a master's in journalism there. Um, so I worked at a newspaper called the St. Petersburg Times. It's our local newspaper here. Um, it's now called the Tampa Bay Times. Uh, I was there for about 17 years, did a lot of local reporting, beat reporting. Um, and then after 17 years thought, well, I do want to teach. And I became a, a journalism teacher in a, in a local high school. Um, I married to the education editor at the Times. Um, and I had three children, including one who lives in San Francisco and works for Dolby, Dolby Sound. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, now, just a little bit about media wise. So um, we're an organization basically that you know, we've tried to give people of all ages um, skills so that they can be critical consumers of content online. We teach media literacy, we teach fact-checking fact skills, and our, our audiences are teenagers, um, college students. We really try to concentrate with Gen Z. We also have programs for older adults as well as Spanish speakers, and this is sort of our motto, our, our mission statement. Our goal is to support citizens who know that when truth prevails, democracy wins. Um, a little bit about MediaWise's history. We started in 2018. I was not there. I've only been there since probably about 2022. But that was when our team, what we call our team fact-checking network started. 
And since then we've expanded, we did a 2020 MediaWise voter project, which we're trying to update for 2024. And we started our programs for seniors and we started what we call our campus correspondents who are college students who do fact-checking workshops um, in universities across the United States. Um, we also have really expanded internationally in the last couple of years. We have programs in Brazil and Germany, Canada, we're in India, um, Spain, and we also have a ongoing project going with the American Library Association. Uh, that's a little bit of MediaWise's history, but let me tell you a little bit about our team fact-checking network, and this I'm going to feature one for you. Um, so the team fact-checking network, I have about anywhere from 12 to 20 kids across the United States. We call it a virtual newsroom, and I'm kind of the manager, editor, um, teach them fact-checking skills, and then it's their job to find disinformation online or to find possible disinformation online, fact check it, and they create a video um, and uh, we publish it, have a series on YouTube called Is This Legit? We're on TikTok, we're on Instagram, and we're on um, X, formerly Twitter. Um, I just wanted to play a little bit of this one because this is Sahil, he's one of our teens and he's from the San Francisco area. He goes to a high school there. He's a junior now at a school called Lick Wilmerding High School in San Francisco. And um, so this can, I'll just play a little bit of it. There, these are our longer videos. They're like three to six minutes long, but I'll, I'll play a little bit at the beginning. don't think we can hear the sound right now. Sorry, I'm trying to go to next. All right, I hope that you heard a little bit of that. Um, were you able to hear a little bit of that? So, sorry, we couldn't hear the sound on that video. Oh, no, I am sorry. Um, well, that is the hill. <laughs> and this is, uh, oh, that makes me worried about some things in the future, but let me, um, let me move on then to, It does not seem to be changing. There we go. There we go. Um, I'm sorry that you couldn't hear it. Now I was trying to give you a little picture of what we do and what um, the kids do. Um, but moving on, um, hopefully my a couple of my videos will work in the future. Um, so we're here today, of course, to talk about media literacy, and 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 this is just a little bit of why we think it's so important. MediaWise did a um, uh, a study with YouGov uh, two years ago in 2022. And we surveyed, um, I I'm not exactly sure how many respondents, about 3,000, I believe. And this is these are just some of the results that we got. 62% of the respondents thought that they saw false or misleading information online every week. And 55% of respondents said they themselves think that they have shared false or misleading information because they thought it was true. Um, and then um, and then this particular graphic here shows you that among Gen Z millennials and Gen X respondents, they are either moderately to extremely concerned about their friends and family believing false or misleading information online. So it is something that is a is really, as you all know, I'm sure, a huge concern um, among um, you know, among all of us here in the United States right now. So let's just play a little game. I'm trying to see if I can see the chat here. Oh, okay, it's way over here. Um, let's play a little game. I'm gonna show you all a couple of pictures and I images. I want you to tell me if you think they are real, fake. And if you want, you can just sort of, um... okay, someone's telling me about share sound. Am I not sharing? sound. 
Um, anyhow, I'll, I'll work on that next time I get to, uh, um, I'll say, I'll, I'll work on that next time I get to a video. So let's try a little game though. And if you guys want to um, just put in the chat, whether you think these photos are real or fake. All right, what do you think about this one? Real or fake? This is Trump getting arrested in New York City. Do you think it's real or fake? Go ahead and type in. Yeah, you can just put in what you think. Fake, fake, fake. Oops, one person thinks real, one person fake. Okay. It looks like most of you might think it's fake. How about this next one? Real or fake? Oops, question mark. Real. This one's a tricky one, I think. Real, real. Okay, how about this one? Real or fake? I'm betting a few of you have seen this picture. Real or fake? We're going to talk about this one a little bit later. Fake, 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 it looks like. How about this one here, real or fake? Do we know who this is? Does everyone know who this is? Real, real, real. Real Messi, yep. <laughs> That's Lionel Messi, soccer player. Um, okay, how about this one? Real or fake? Also Lionel Messi. Lionel Messi is apparently one of the most AI'd, you know, famous people, celebrity people in the uh, in the world. I'm not exactly sure why. He's famous, right? Okay, and our last one, real or fake? Do we know who this is? Real or fake? This is Macron, right? President Macron caught in a in a riot last year um in i believe in paris fake 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 good okay so let's talk then a little bit about you know how you know how do you know whether things are real or fake i will tell you let me go backwards real quick um this one is fake this one is fake this one is real this one is fake. This is one of the, I feel like this is the photo that really made everybody start thinking about AI in the past year. And uh, this one is actually real. I thought it was fake at first too, but it's actually real, a picture of a little dog at a park. And this one is fake, all right? But how how is it that you know, what can you do to figure out if something is real or fake? So I took three of those photos and I want to just point out a couple of things within them. Let me go up here. Put the chat over here. Okay. So some things that you can do. AI, let me just preface this with saying AI is getting better and better and better. Um, and some of these little details that I'm going to point out to you, they're, they're fixing these now when they create AI. But one of the things that you used to be able to do, like in this Trump photo, is look closely at faces um, besides the main character in the photo. Look in the background and you'll see that these faces are super blurry and sometimes just blobs. That's a good indication that you're looking at AI. Now on the Pope photo, if you look really closely and you zoom in, you see things, especially like with accessories that they have like the glasses or the necklace. Is the glasses seem to kind of melt into space. There, there's no real definition. Hands are a big thing. His hands here just kind of don't look real. They look kind of like claws. And if you look at the cross closely, you don't see the chain on the other side. And hands, as I said before, look at the Macron one. Um, I mean, this makes no sense. If, the, if you think you're looking at AI right now, one of the things you should do is just zero in on the hands because it can't seem to get hands too well. 
Uh, this woman has, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six fingers, seven fingers here. So those are some small, fine details that you can kind of clue in on to see if maybe what you're looking at is fake, okay? So let's just go over a little bit about what we're gonna cover. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is missing disinformation, how AI works. So it sounds like maybe a previous speaker talked about that a little bit, but I'll go through it kind of quickly. Different types of AI misinformation that you might see, and then tips for spotting AI misinformation, as well as just some sort of overall practical fact-checking tips so that you can um, fact-check things that you think are a little suspicious when you come across them online. So what is the difference between information and disinformation? Um, misinformation is when someone unintentionally shares false or misleading information. This can come from your friends or your family. You know, they think they are kind of thinking they might be helping you. So they're sharing something with you. And I think about misinformation as a mistake. Okay. Disinformation, on the other hand, is sharing, is intentionally sharing false information. And that's when you think about those uh, sort of huge Russian troll farms that were producing all kinds of disinformation during the 2000 election. Okay. Um, now, just to talk a little bit about motivations. Now, for misinformation, the motivations are different between misinformation and disinformation. Um, misinformation, unintentional, people just maybe want to help you out. They think you need this. They think you need this information, so they're going to share it with you. Or they have some kind of emotional connection to it. They think it's really funny or, or it makes them really angry and they just share. Or they kind of just identify with it. They see it and they think, oh, this really is how I feel too, so I'm going to share it. That's usually how the motivation behind misinformation. Disinformation, on the other hand, people doing it intentionally, they're usually doing it to try to get clicks, to try to get followers, or they might be doing it because they want to manipulate you a little bit and change your mind about an issue, right? Or some people are just flat out doing it because they're trying to disrupt our democracy. Um, I have a little example on the, on the left here of a fact page from um, Instagram. I think it's from Instagram. If you look on Instagram, there are just hundreds and hundreds of these things called fact pages. Uh, if you see the word fact in the name, it's probably not entirely factual, the things they post, because probably you'll also see in the bio, you know, here's the link where you can buy merchandise from me, or here's my PayPal link. Um, that's a good indication that what you're looking at, you know, if someone's trying to make money off of it, not necessarily is it all going to be true. Um, so I took just the other day, I put this little slide together and it took me about three minutes just to find all of these headlines. Because what we want to focus on, of course, today is AI. Um, and it is truly one of the things that people are most concerned about with our election. How AI puts elections at risk. Um, AI poses the biggest global risk. AI presents political peril. It's all very scary. So it is really great that you guys are um, kind of jumping in on this. Um, right now. So let's talk a little bit about what is generative, they call it generative artificial intelligence. Um, and basically what it is, is artificial intelligence, something that mimics the human brain, and it creates content. Generative means create. So it's, it can create writing, images, photos, artwork, videos, music, um, even voices. Like I know you all talked about the uh, Joe Biden fake robocall last time. Um, basically, the way that they've, the way that it works is it, they've taken a computer and they've scraped as much information as they can, just sucked it up from the internet, and programmed these um, AI tools to prompt. Can you write? Can you produce a picture of um, Macron, President Macron, in the middle of the riots on the streets of Paris? And it gives you something. Um, that we have, there are lots of different tools now, ChatGPT, Google, Gemini, Bing, um, all kinds of different tools. The thing about it that you should be aware of though is it's not always um, factual and it can generate falsehoods. Um, and it's basically only based on what has been put into it, right? So if falsehoods are put into it, it could produce falsehoods also. But also, it just produces these things called hallucinations, we call them. Um, so what I did is I took, just the other day, I took Chat GPT, 
That's one that can produce writing for you. And you put a prompt in and ask it to write something for you. So first I said, write a profile of Kathleen Tobin. And it came back with nothing. It said, we don't, we don't know anything about her. So then I thought, well, maybe if I put my maiden name in there, um, it might tell me, uh, might find some information on me. So I said, write a profile of Kathleen Ovac Tobin. Um, Cause I know Ovac was my byline I used when I was a reporter. I know it's in on the internet somewhere. And this is what it came back with. Um, Kathleen Ovac Tobin is a leading environmental scientist and advocate based in the verdant landscapes of Portland, Oregon. Um, with a profound dedication to sustainability and a fervent belief in the power of community action, Kathleen has become a prominent voice in the fight for a greener, more resilient planet. So I, you know, this, they just, this is all just made up. This is fake. I, I've never even been to Portland, Oregon. So do know though that I am the only person named Kathleen Ovac Tobin because my name is, my main name is very distinctive. We are the only Ovacs in the United States. There's a lot of Novax or Covax, but there are no Ovax. So I don't know where it got this. And you can also, um, this also, this just this little tiny clip of writing kind of also tells you how it's not the best writing either. You know, it has a lot of um, uh, not great writing in my opinion. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in, as we move on too. So, uh, there are just two types of tools that um, are probably most familiar to you. One is ChatGPT, which can um, um, generate writing. It's not the best writing. Um, this was one of my colleagues asked it to write a story about our, our local baseball stadium and they're in the middle of a redevelopment project. And it got, it did, did get the um, facts correct, but the writing itself is uh, you know, very cliche written. As the sun sets on the iconic stadium era, a new dawn emerges with ambitious visions of mixed use spaces, green parks and bustling commercial zones. So it's not the best writing. And that's one way to, to kind of um, find it or, or spot it also when you come across it. And then of course there's um, Mid Journey, another um, uh, AI, generative AI company, which produces a lot of artwork. And my colleague said, oh, can you give me uh, an image of a um, of the, the baseball stadium that's going to be built in St. Petersburg, Florida? And it came up with these pictures. Um, so next, I do want to talk a little bit about um, using AI for good. I, I don't want to leave you all with the impression that it that AI is all bad. It seems like doom and gloom coming our way, right? But there are some things that you can use AI for that are useful. Um, summaries of something sorting or classifying documents. Reporters use um, for brainstorming story ideas. Um, and, and it's very, very useful for those sorts of things. Um, but AI is not really good at some things also. It, it really um, is good at offering an unbiased view of the world. There's a lot of bias built into it because it's taking the information from what's online so, which is often biased. So it's going to produce a biased view of the world. It's not often very factual. Um, and it, it also isn't going to give you a lot of new information because a lot of these um, uh, generative AI machines were kind of used. It's not as up to date, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, I wanted to give you a little um, example of what I mean by the bias that is built into it. The Washington Post did a story um, and they asked the, an image generator called Dolly for portraits of people cleaning, okay? It gave them all women. And then it asked for portraits of attractive people and it gave them all um, young people. And here's another thing it did. They asked them for portraits of a person at social services. It gave them all um, people of color. It asked them for a portrait of a photo of a productive person. It gave them mostly white people, all men sitting at desks. So it, it has a lot of bias and stereotypes built into it. Um, and so that is something, if you ever want to use it, you know, which is, you know, we all like to play around with it. If you ever do want to use it for anything, just, just understand it's not completely factual and it's it really is filled with a lot of bias right now. Things are getting better and better though with AI. 
So now I wanted to talk just a little bit about different types of AI misinformation that you might see online. Now, I was going to play this video. So I want to look at the, um, I would like to, it says to share Zoom. I'm looking at somebody gave me some info here. The meeting toolbar, click share screen, the share selection window. Select the program or desktop image to share. Can I just, let me just try this and see if you hear it. If you just put a thumbs down if you are not hearing it, I guess. We're not hearing this. Anyone side. hearing it? No. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, Francis, do you think I have time to go back and um, do this or can you I just sort to, of explain? You need, to lock, you need to stop sharing and then reshare again. When you when you reshare, you need to click, click on share sound. Okay, stop I'm gonna give that a try then, y'all, okay? Yeah, when um, you share the screen, there is a little things on the left bottom corner. You can click and share sound, share computer sound. Okay. Hold on one second. I'll give this a try again. Um, so share screen now. Somewhere I'm supposed to see something that says share sound. Now I'm not seeing it. Is it at the share screen button? Hold on. Sorry, y'all. Before you share, yes. Before I share, you need to I'm stop drop. sharing again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So before you, yeah, there's turn. usually a drop down thing there, and there is no drop down thing. It just says share screen. All right. I I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, no, I'm, I'm gonna know. gonna bring it in again. Um, if um, or if you have the links to the video, you can send it to Sophia. She can um, share it. Okay. Um, I, I think I might just, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just uh, explain to you what's going on in it. Uh, okay, this sure. is a video, like I said, Lionel Messi is kind of the uh, guy everybody, uh, the celebrity everybody wants to make fake images of. Um, there also is this guy, I forget his name, but he's super famous for making deep fake videos of Tom Cruise. And I'm sure you may have seen those. Um, and so a deep fake video is, is one that makes it look and sound like someone is doing something that they're not. Um, and these are amazingly, you know, well done as far as what they look like. And um, you may not hear it, but I'll, I'll just let you look at it. And, and these are the kind of videos that um, are kind of entertaining, kind of humorous. There's really nothing, um, you know, they're kind of harmless, right? Um, so, uh, Tom Cruise, as well as Keanu Reeves, he has, a, there's a whole fake Keanu Reeves, um, Instagram and, uh, TikTok going on, um, and they're harmless and they're made for entertainment value, right? But there are also deep fakes that are made that are, um, you know, uh, definitely not harmless. Um, this one is... Uh, one that was made after the war began in Ukraine. And um, someone in Ukraine put this together and it's a deep fake of Vladimir Zelensky. And what he says in this deep fake is he is telling his troops to lay down their arms and surrender. Um, and not only did they create this deep fake and spread it around Ukraine, but they also hacked into a, um, a news station one night and got it put on the air. People were pretty quick to realize that, of course, and he came out and said it was a deep fake. But that's the kind of harmful thing that we may be seeing um, as this election goes on. Okay. Um, well, I'm looking at a comment about the new video from the Lincoln Project and Fred Trump. I'll have to look that one up. Yes. So you guys look this up. It is this deep fake you can find everywhere actually now. Um, all right, 
Now, another type of um, misinformation, of course, that you're going to see is AI images, like this one of the folk in the puffer jacket that we saw. And again, some of these are created just to be humorous, just to um, you know, have, have harmless fun. And that's really what this hope in the puffer jacket was, right? Although a lot of people were taken in by this. That's why I say that it was kind of the image that brought everyone's attention to, oh my gosh, what is going on with this AI? Now here's one that was recent, that recently happened, um, came out after, you know, a couple of weeks ago, after the uh, Grammys. And this was um, supposedly a photo that went viral of Taylor Swift holding holding up a um, sign that said Trump won and Democrats cheated. And uh, PolitiFact, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with PolitiFact, but also based at the Pointer Institute where MediaWise is, um, they did a fact check on it. And of course, this did not happen. These, I think, are going to be some of the um, some of the things that you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of in the coming months. Um, doctored images, doctored videos, okay? And so we have uh, doctored videos, doctored images. You also will be seeing AI text um, happening. Um, this, one of my colleagues created this, uh, a, a, he I would say probably in the space of 10 minutes created a whole fake news site. He had them make bios for the managing editor, make bios for the reporters, create headshots for the reporters, create fake news stories. It took about five minutes for him to do that. And so that is something else that I really want you to be on the lookout for. And these are called pink slime sites. We call them pink slime sites. It's basically named after like a, a meat, that sort of pink slime meat byproduct um, that fit, that's used as filler in some meats. What's, what has happened in the past maybe decade, as, as I'm sure you know, is that a lot of news organizations have gone out of business. They're struggling, they've had to close. And what has swooped in to kind of take their place are what we call these pink slime sites. And they look like real news sites and they have headlines and they have bylines and they have names of reporters. Um, but a, And some of the news, um, most of it, a lot of it is, you know, generated by AI, and some of it is is factual. Um, uh, and these are these sites are taking the place of closed um, that have had to close. Um, some of it is factual, but a lot of it is not, and a lot of it, if you read closely, is going to be very slanted because often these pink slime sites are funded by outside companies who have, you know, some some goal in mind. Um, usually a partisan source, They're, um, whether political or they want you, they want you to believe something. So they set up these sites to make them look real, to, make, to pull you in, to draw you in, and make you think that you're reading an actual news site. But often they're just automate, automatically generated news. And one way that you can um, figure out if you're looking, one thing that you should do figure out if you're suspicious, you might be looking at a pink slime site, is to find their about page. Um, because every good legit news organization is gonna have an about page that explains who they are, how you can find them, how you can contact them. They'll have an ethics policy on there. They'll have a um, corrections, way to make a correction, call in some error. Um, but pink slime sites often don't have any about page whatsoever. And some, and some of them actually have about pages that say, um, yeah, we're sponsored by this so-and-so political um, organization. And our goal is to do this, this, or this. Um, but, but they often have news that is just not factual or slanted in a certain way. So you're gonna wanna be on the lookout for pink slime journalism sites. Um, and then of course, another way that AI, um, that type of AI that you're gonna see is voice cloning, AI voice cloning. And this is what we saw a couple of weeks ago in New Hampshire when that fake Joe Biden robocall came out, urging voters not to vote. Um, since then, the state attorney's office has looked into it and they, um, they have actually passed a law. On, Fed on February 8th, the, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, has n now outlawed these scam robocalls. You know, does that mean they're gonna stop? I don't know, but it does mean that people can be held accountable if it does happen. Um, 
So, you know, stuff is it's changing, laws are changing as we're going along, as, as the weeks go by. Um, okay. So we, would, we do want to give you some tips and skills that you can use when you come across what you think might be AI um, misinformation. And really, truly, the first, the advice that we give, the very first thing we think you should do is hit pause. If you see something that grabs you kind of emotionally, that, that you read some, a post online and it makes you really angry, or it makes you um, sad or scared, or, or maybe even makes you laugh, um, that is a really that is your first sign that you want to just stop and think about it before you share anything, because uh, the people who create misinformation um, often manipulate you this way. Because if you have a strong reaction to something, you're more inclined to click quickly or share quickly without checking into whether this might be true or not. Okay, so the first, that's the first thing: hit pause and think about it. Um, then. We have um, developed these three questions that we think are super useful. Um, uh, we, MediaWise did a lot of research in 2018 when they started. And it was with the um, Stanford History Education Group, which has now become the Digital Inquiry Group, if that's what it's called now. And they came up with these three questions that you should always ask yourself before you share something or before you, if you want to double check to see if something is factual or not. The first thing you're going to ask is who's behind the information. The second thing is what's the evidence, and then what do other sources say? It seems almost um, obvious, um, and I'm, I'm sure that many of you already do this anyhow. Um, but if you think about it in terms of these th three questions, it will really help you with fact checking. So what I want to do is kind of walk you through um, fact checking something using these three questions. So the first question, of course, is who's behind the information? And I'm going to use the Pope in a puffer jacket for this. Um, so this, this post here um, from somebody named Leonardo, probably one of the first posts with this photo that went viral, okay? And so the first thing that you want to do, you know, this, and this is a post that's grabbed a lot of people, right? And it grabbed them probably through humor and, and laughter um, and made everybody click there, click share, click share. Um, it went very viral. Um, but you want to say to yourself, if something makes you laugh like that, or if something seems out of character for the person in it, like would the Pope really wear a jacket like this? Would Taylor Swift really walk down the run, you know, the red carpet with a sign like that? Um, if it's out of character, stop and say, who, who is this posting? So you ask, who is Leonardo? And you can click on their bio, right? Who's behind the information? So I clicked on Leonardo. It doesn't really give me much information. Nothing that I that makes me think, oh, is he connected to Rome? Is he connected to the Pope in any way? Is he a photographer? It does give me an Instagram um, um, link. So if you click on ins the Instagram link, you can get a little bit more information. But in this case, it doesn't tell me that this man is any sort of expert or photographer who would be sharing this photo. So that doesn't help me, right? But I found out who's behind the information. Not much, right? Still no indication. So my, I go to my second question. What's the evidence? And this is the another way that you can figure out, is it real or not? Whenever you see a post, look for any links within it um, that you can click on, okay? That might bring you to a primary source. Uh, there were no links in this post, though. But one thing I can do is what we call a reverse image search. Um, I'm wondering if you're... Um, familiar with this, um, if you've ever done this. There are diff definitely different reverse image search tools you can use, Google Lens, InVid. You can take a screenshot of the photo, put it in Google Lens, um, and that will kind of track down where else on the internet this has shown up. And that can help you sort of maybe bring you back to the primary source. Um, InVid is a plugin that you can download onto your computer. And it's it can do videos and images. Um, and I like InVid because it kind of um, tells you the date, the dates that these uh, photos appeared. And you can go to the very beginning, to figure out when it first appeared and if it's maybe the, if a photo or an image is being used out of context. Okay. So we did a reverse image search with the Pope and the puffer jacket. And this was one result that came up. It, it came from Reddit. Um, so we clicked on that. And we found that it 
And this was a, a little ways back, right? Remember, we found that it, some somebody called Mid Journey or something called Mid Journey had posted this. This happened before a lot of people knew what Mid Journey was. So then you say, well, what is Mid Journey? And you can do a uh, you know a, a Google search. What is Mid Journey? And you can get the information that Mid Journey is a generative AI lab that creates unique artwork and sex prompts. And so you know it's not real and, and it's confirmed, right? Um, but those are the steps that you wanna use. And the idea is to figure out um, who's posting it and if there's any evidence for it being true or not, all right? Um, now, um, the other thing of course you can do is what we did with the Pope and the puffer jacket. We looked at these close little details and clues, okay? Um, and you can do that with images, absolutely. Um, and then the third thing, the third question is, what do other sources say? And this is where we say to do what we call lateral reading. Um, and that's the idea that you're going to do the site where you are, open up a new tab, do a keyword search, which is what we did. What, what is this picture of the Pope in a puffer jacket? And then you're going to come up with a lot of results. Um, in this case, the Pope Francis puffer coat was fake, okay? We spoke to the guy who created the viral AI image. You can find even more information behind the photo that way. So those are the three types of, um, of questions that we want you all to keep in mind, right? Um, just some, some tips. I know, I know we want to save some time for some questions. Um, number one, what I said before, if a post elicits some sort of emotional response, that, that is maybe a sign that someone's trying to manipulate you. So pause, just pause, think about it, try to do a little fact checking. Number two, if it's about a well-known figure and shows them doing something out of character, that's another tip, hit pause. Um, please make sure before you share anything, it's very hard for young people, especially, I think they're just so used to moving fast. Um, fact check before sharing anything, okay? And practice those three questions. Who's behind the information? What's the evidence? And then number three, what do other sources say? Um, so that's kind of the end of my presentation. I do have some resources to share with you. I don't know if you could take screenshots of these. I don't, I'm not exactly sure, um, you know, who makes up our audience here, but if there are any educators out there, um, MediaWise has produced a lot of um, lesson plans in conjunction with PBS. And you can find our, um, last year we produced 30 fact-checking videos, like the one that Sahil was in at the beginning. And um, each one of those videos has a lesson plan in conjunction with it. And you can, um, I can send these to Francis also, these links, if anyone is interested in looking at our, um, at our uh, lesson plans. And then last year also, one of my colleagues created a really cool thing. It's a zine, sort of a graphic magazine um, called Reality Check. Um, if you're an educator, or even if you'd like to get some information out to young people, um, we have a flipbook version of it online, but you can, there's also a PDF of it, and you can download it and print it. Um, it's just filled with lots of good media literacy tips. It's got some games in it. It's basically aimed at high school, probably 6th to 12th grade, I would say. Um, and then I do also want to tell you, and I meant to put in an extra slide, that we are creating a new series this year called How to Internet. And I will send, and it, it kind of covers more about how to be safe on the internet and how to be a good digital citizen when you go on the internet. And it's, you know, my what I've been trying to do is um, kind of aim these, um, these lessons that we've created at younger and younger people, because I really think like third, fourth and fifth graders are getting online now and even younger. So our how-to internet series is going to focus more on younger people um, and how to be safe online. Um, and I can send all of these links to Frances and hopefully she can share. Um, let's see. I, I don't know if you want to follow MediaWise, but if you do, we are at MediaWise on all of these platforms. Um, we're pretty simple to find. We're on tic our, our kids, our students do a lot on TikTok and Instagram. Um, it looks like I'm getting questions already. So um, should I be taking them, Francis, from the chat? Um, 
could you first go back to the previous screen with the resources or how to follow? I think there's one. Oh, sure. I need to go back to the previous screen. Um, I would encourage everyone to follow MediaWise or just go on their website. I found free training um, <laughs> programs on your website that are very mm -hmm. useful. Um, yeah, and you will also uh, find the other thing that we're doing right now also is um, um, we have MediaWise in Espanol. So for Spanish speakers, and um, we're updating all of our videos and, and our um, you know tips and uh, all of our resources for Spanish speakers right now. And they should all be hopefully ready to be uh, put online by maybe end of April, May, because um, we're trying to get a lot of stuff updated and ready for this election that's coming. I'm just trying to make sure the previous screen with uh, the steps to take, and this is Karen asking the for the slide. Um, do you have the? Do you want this one? Oh, there we go. Is that, okay. is this it, Karen? Um, and Eleanor has her hand up. Um, Eleanor, do you have a question? Uh, no, I was trying to type it into the Q and A. But my question that I was going to ask was, um, during election season, uh, we're inundated with flyers from the various campaigns. Mm -hmm. And if it is from the official campaign, you can see that's usually noted on it. But is there anything else that people can do? I mean, these are arrive oh, yeah. every day, three to five to 10 of them. And mm -hmm. how can you determine that it really is accurate? So one kind of quick thing you could do, and I know these are print things, right, that you're getting through in your mailbox, right? Right. Um, you could you could try a reverse image search though by just simply you know using your phone and taking a photo because they do do a lot of doctor images on those flyers, uh -huh. and um, you could take a picture of it and um, try a reverse image search and see if it, if this actual picture really comes up anywhere at all. I know locally last year for a couple, 2022 election for our local elections. They, oh, they, I must have, you're exactly right. I must have gotten, you know, five or six of them a day. And one of the candidates, they had Photoshopped the t-shirt that he was wearing to say, have some kind of slogan that he had, it wasn't on his t-shirt. And if you did a reverse image search, you could find that same picture um, with the correct t-shirt on it. So you can do that. And of course, you know, I always do want to say, call your elections offices. And even go online and search uh, and look at the campaign's um, websites also, because they may answer, you uh -huh. know, they may put something on there that will be, a, that will give you an indication. And hopefully the news, your local newspaper will cover stuff like that too, if there are fake um, sort of mailers that are going out. That's what they should be doing. So. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Sure. I think I see one here that says, is Snopes still a good resource for fact checking? We consider it a good resource. We do. Um, there are a lot of fact-checking organizations out there now. Snopes is probably one of the original ones. Um, but but my students use Snopes to, um, um, con you know, when they want to confirm a fact check that they're they're doing or researching. Um, but Snopes, PolitiFact, of course, um, uh, USA Today has a good fact-checking group. Um, the Annenberg School, it's just called factcheck.org is also a good fact-checking resource. Um, let me see what else. Rumor Guard, I think Rumor Guard is, that's a good one too from News Literacy Project, I believe. Um, also a good one to look at. Um, let's see. So um, I see a question in the Q&A here that, um, do you believe our legal and justice system can effectively adapt to the rapid advancements in AI, mm -hmm. given the time it takes for laws to be enacted, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on whether the system can keep pace with AI development. Well, I think it's going to be really hard, um, which is why we have to sort of be on the front lines ourselves, you know. Although I was surprised at how quickly the FCC passed that robocall law. Um, so that was good. I'm probably not an expert to really answer that question. And I do know that things are getting better and better, moving faster and faster. So that's why I do kind of think right now, at least for this year, it's going to be up to us to um, really be vigilant about it and, and think about it, you know? Um, yeah. um, I see a question. It, it, Sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, so it was just interesting. Um, it was right after our last session. The day after was the new FCC mm -hmm. law about uh, vo uh, robocalls with generated voice. Right. Um, and then I think yesterday, OpenAI just came out with a new text-to-video generator called Sora, oh. <laughs> which will yeah, probably make it even easier to produce um, digital videos that could be used for misinformation. Right. Um, so it right. just, again, demonstrates how we have to really keep up with everything, all the new movements and developments that's going on in this area. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I see a good question in here about um, the Pointer Institute and funding. Um, the Pointer Institute has received funding from Bill Melinda Gates, Google, CNN, Facebook. We also get funding from GNI. Um, and YouTube um, and sometimes Meta. We are a nonprofit and we are, this was, uh, you know, coming from school system, coming from a, a newspaper, this was a new thing for me. Yes, we are funded by a lot of different organizations. Um, and and the question is, is there at all a concern of bias in the point of media wise fact checking endeavor itself? Um, this is a good question. Um, everything that we produce that um, is funded by these types of sources, we always maintain editorial control. We are the ones who are the final deciders on what goes in or out. And we are a journalistic organization at heart. So yes, we do have, um, you know, we follow regular journalistic ethics. Um, I And we also are part of what is called the, um, and Nina Wise is too, Teen Fact Checking Network is, is a signatory of what is called the International Fact Checking Network, IFCN. And the IFCN has certain standards that you have to meet for fact checking. Um, and if you are a signatory of them, that indicates that you have met these standards. And one of them is that, um, you know, you wanna fact check misinformation, um, but we, we definitely try to fact check, even, even the students, I say, we have to fact check from all directions. You know, I, we, we all have our own personal biases built into ourselves. Um, we can't deny that, we know, but we also are a, a newsroom at heart and we try to fact check um, across the political spectrum and across whatever spectrum we, um, you know, um, whatever it is that the kids find, um, if we think that it is something that is of interest to our audience, which is teenagers and college students, then we will fact check it. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, I hope it does. So I've sent the video of Sehel to my colleague. Um, she can share oh, that. We can just take a look at one of your, um, the teen fact-checking network, the Great. type of videos they produce. Um, Thank you. Thank Sophia, if you could share that video. Do you want me to stop sharing now? Or, or are you? Um... Yeah, you can stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Um... I don't know if anyone had any other questions. I will I will pull all of those resources together for you, Francis, if you don't mind. Great, that would be great. Do you want to show this now, Sahils? Oh yeah. Oh great. Uh oh. Are you there? Sophia, will you be sharing the video? Okay. And Buffalo Bill safety, Demar Hamlin collapsed in the middle of an NFL game. Thankfully, doctors say he's doing well and hanging with his friends and teammates. But that hasn't stopped a lot of people from pushing theories about what caused this unexpected condition. On Instagram, one person wrote, Pfizer kills a black man on live television and then tells us that we're not supposed to talk about it. Whoa, this person is saying that the COVID vaccine was the cause for Hamlin's collapse? Time to find out, is this legit? Hi everyone, this is Sahil, and welcome back to another episode of Is This Legit? A series brought to you by MediaWise and PBS Student Reporting Labs, where we fact check viral misinformation online and teach you ways to do it on your own. First, let's investigate this Hamlin case together, and then second, talk about vaccine misinformation on social media more broadly. Three things to know about the Hamlin case. Just to be clear, he is alive breathing, walking, and talking. He even attended a Bills game three weeks after his collapse, sitting in a box and waving to fans. Two, we still don't even know Hamlin's vaccine status. It's never been confirmed. And three, experts, 
remember the key word here, experts, think his collapse is most likely linked to a condition called commodio cordis. That's when a blow to the chest, delivered at exactly the right place at exactly the right time, can cause a dangerous heart arrhythmia or cardiac arrest. Unfortunately, COVID vaccine misinformation has become widespread. Tons of similar claims have been posted online saying that the vaccine causes athletes to drop dead on the field. One of the earliest claims was about soccer player Christian Eriksen, who collapsed on the field back in 2021. On social media, the post went viral saying it was caused by the COVID vaccine. But that theory was quickly debunked since he wasn't even vaccinated. This situation sparked a lot of other similar social media chatter. Vaccine disinformation also spread about Gilbert Cuomo, a gold medalist runner, and Frank Barrier, a French soccer player. But all of those claims have been repeatedly investigated and repeatedly debunked. To date, I'm not aware of a single COVID vaccine related cardiac complication in professional sports. Matthew Martinez, a sports cardiologist who works with the National Football League, National Basketball Association, National Hockey League, and Major League Soccer, told PolitiFact. So whenever you come across frightening theories like these, first, just pause. Certain posts on social media might stir up an emotional response, often because they're exaggerated or false. So do your best to assess the situation before reacting or reposting. Second, be sure to evaluate the scientific evidence around a topic, especially when you're looking into the vaccine. Ask yourself these three questions. Who is behind the information? What is the evidence? And what do other sources say? In just this past year, over 17,000 different COVID-related theories have spread online, many of which seem to quote scientific studies. So when should you question the expertise of experts? Take this Damar Hamlin post I mentioned earlier. When you see a jarring claim like this, ask yourself two questions. One, does the writer have relevant expertise? In this case, Toby Rogers describes himself as a revolutionary and political economist, neither of which has anything to do with healthcare. And two, what do the majority of scientists think about this claim? You can figure this out by doing what we call lateral reading. Do a keyword search, open many different tabs and read laterally, find reliable sources, and compare the scientific reasoning across them all. You'll quickly find articles like these all debunking this claim. One final point, use lateral reading to avoid being trapped in an echo chamber. This is when social media algorithms promote similar content, sometimes disinformation, over and over again in your feed. To figure out if you've been living in an echo chamber, ask yourself, are the things you're reading on your feed helping you better understand an issue, or are they just giving you a narrow perspective on an important topic? Are the posts you're reading just confirming pre-existing biases, or does the information give you different opinions and different points of view? And now for our rating, the COVID vaccine did not cause Damar Hamlin's collapse. We rate this claim as not legit. More broadly, opinions on the negative effects of the COVID vaccine often need context. It's really important that you get out of your echo chamber and read from many different sources, from the left as well as from the right. And always make sure to evaluate how reliable your information is. Where does it come from? It is it based in scientific evidence. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Is This Legit? In the future, remember to pause if something you read makes you feel angry or shocked. Then evaluate the evidence behind the claim, judging for yourself if the information is valid or not. Stay media wise. Don't compromise. <laughs> Excellent. Isn't he great? So yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. He's uh so I'm sorry, I love how ahead. at the end he said that, you know, get information from all sides. Mm -hmm. Right. And get out of your echo chamber. That's another big definite good tip. Um yeah, and so uh, I, I, go ahead. Go, go ahead. I, I did want to say too that uh so Hill is involved with another really interesting thing right now. He started his own website, uh, sort of a, a program called Unwiring. And uh, it, it, I think it's him and kids at his uh, high school. And they're basically trying to 
figure out better ways for young people to interact on social media, media, healthier ways for people to interact on social media. And it's really great. It's called unwiring if you if anyone wants to take a look at it. Hmm. Um, I'll just I'll give you one last question. Sure. Um, from personal experience, this is from uh, Bill. Um, I know that AI has a gender and race bias. Has the youth that you worked with experienced biases from their perspective? Um, does that mean have they come across biases in their research or are you saying have they personally experienced biases, which I'm sure they have? Um, um, Bill, if you're still on, do you want to clarify your question? Um, is there I can tell you that and I'm not sure if this is going to answer um you oh like biases against young people yeah I don't know I don't know I don't know about that um I do know that um one of the things that we have to be super careful about because these are young kids um is sort of the mean and angry and nasty commenters and so my colleague who does the social media for MediaWise, you know, some people can be really mean to, to young kids on social media. So, but, you know, I teach them to have like a thick skin that, that, that um, you, you post something on social media and you're going to get a reaction. And a lot of times that might be a good reaction. A lot of times it might be a bad reaction. But a lot of times they do get comments like, you know, like, who are you, kid, to be doing this, you know? Um, we tend to, I, I mean, if people disagree with the point they're making, we don't delete those comments. Nasty comments that are just of no real good value, we'll delete those. I don't know if that's really what you're asking, though. <laughs> I see somebody else asking about government labels, and I, I don't know if there are government, I don't know if that will happen or if that can happen, but definitely the platforms themselves say they're trying to police these things and put labels on it. Like you might see um, something labeled as misinformation um, on YouTube or on, you know, X, X is a little different, but it, 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 they are trying to develop their own ways to police themselves, I guess. But I don't know if the government will ever come out into that. Mm. Yeah, I don't, so, I don't, I, I'm doubtful about that. Um, just because of, you know, free speech, First Amendment, I have a feeling that that wouldn't, wouldn't happen. That's all my only, my opinion. Um, so in the, our next session, which is, um, Sophia, can you help put up the, our next slide? Uh, we will try to cover a little bit on the side of uh, public policy and, you know, legislations and laws. And I, oh. we know the, the recent FCC law that just came out. So we know that, you know, there are those in government who are trying to work to um, prevent harm and, and um, mm -hmm. catch up with, with the AI. But we'll, we'll, we know that takes time, but at least for people working on it, we'll see that how that goes. Um, but thank you, Kathleen, so much for helping us learn about how to fight against misinformation. Um, we learned a lot of new practical rule, uh, tools for, for helping us do that. Um, and just for our audience, just a quick reminder, our next session is on February 28th. If you haven't registered yet, please um, do either scan the QR code or go to this web link to register for our, our next session. Um, thank you again, um, Kathleen, for, for this such an informative uh, session um, and our Next slide, please. So as always, we try to list some, uh, share some trusted resources for nonpartisan election information that might be helpful with the primary election coming up very soon in March. Um, please feel free to take a screenshot of this so you can use these resources to research candidates. Uh, the top one, vote411.org is the probably the most useful uh, website for you all. You can put in your registered voter address and it will give you all of the local candidates and measures that will show up on your ballots, your specific ballot. Um, you can use this to, to research and the other websites are also trusted resources that the league does um, encourage you to use as well. 
So we talked a lot about misinformation, but it's always good to have some trusted resources that mm -hmm. we can use at our, our fingertips. And then lastly, if you enjoyed our program today, we invite you to join us as a member by going to our website. Uh, or if you'd like to support us and help us put on more programs, you can donate by scanning the QR code and it is a uh, tax deductible donation. We are an organization run by volunteers and we appreciate any support from the community. Um, thank you again, um, Kathleen. I think we've gone a few minutes over <laughs> over time, but thank you. This has been a, such a useful session for, for us and our all audience. Well, thank, thank you. you. So we any, appreciate any appreciate last you inviting me. I just appreciate you inviting me um, to come in and talk with you all. We always, always enjoy these types of things. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everyone for, for joining us and have a good weekend.